From the European Parliament in Brussels, this is Raw Politics. Thank you for joining us this evening, and this is what we have on the program, Remembering D-Day, the politics of war commemoration and the strength of today's transatlantic bond. Red Block Rising, how an anti-immigration gamble may have paid off for Denmark's Social Democrats. May's last day, Theresa May gets ready to stand down as Conservative leader, so who should replace her? Shoe Scrap, Japan's government defends mandatory high heels for women in the workplace. And Border Bungle, Donald Trump imagines a wall between Ireland and Northern Ireland in tonight's Raw Moments. All right, it is time to meet our panelists this evening. We have Esther Zalan. She's a reporter at EU Observer. Esther, what story are you watching closely tonight? I'm excited to look at Denmark. I mean, it involves so many of the issues we talked about. We're looking at possibly the youngest prime minister in Denmark, uh, the shift to the right generally on migration. I think it's a fascinating topic. It's a really interesting topic. political discussion indeed. All right, joining us as well is Jamie Shea. He's a former NATO senior official and senior fellow from Friends of Europe. What about you, Jamie? Well, I'm following the D-Day story because uh, I feel that this is unique. You're going to have elections, of course, in Europe for virtually every year. Uh, many of the other things that we can talk about today are going to rumble on. But mm -hmm. this D-Day is unique uh, because uh, in 100 years' time, those 500 veterans that you see today on the Normandy beaches, they're not going to be there any longer. Exactly. That link with living history is going to be broken and therefore I think we should spend an hour or so just to listen to what they an have to tell so, us. An hour or so, okay, we might not have enough time for that, but we will talk about that. Okay, and also joining us, Daniel Freund. He's a German MEP elect with the Greens. What about you, Daniel? Yeah, uh, I'm picking the, the D-Day remembering as well. Uh, I think the sign that we have just had with these European elections, uh, more voters, better turnout than, mm -hmm. than the last 25 years, and I think the signal how important peace in Europe is, and, and also the uh, resistance against uh, extremism, against uh, Euroskeptics. Lessons learned, if, yeah. any, if any. All right. OK, that is exactly where we're beginning today, in fact, the anniversary of D-Day. As it was 75 years ago today that Allied troops landed in Normandy to begin the liberation of Nazi-occupied France. World leaders from several countries joined D-Day veterans in France for a day of commemorations. But as they remembered the shared sacrifices, a different legacy of D-Day was also highlighted that of the importance of multinational alliance. We owe our freedom to our veterans. And whatever it takes, we will never surrender. And whatever it takes, we will always stand together. Because this is our common destiny. Et je crois, chère Thérèse Amé, que nous pouvons être fiers des actions menées ensemble, des causes portées en commun, pour nos deux pays, comme sur le plan international. Nous pouvons être fiers des résultats obtenus, dont ce mémorial n'est pas la moindre des illustrations. Et je vous en remercie. Vive l'amitié entre nos deux pays. It is incredibly moving to be here today, looking out across beaches where one of the greatest battles for freedom this world has ever known took place. And it is truly humbling to do so with the men who were there that day. You are the pride of our nation. You are the glory of our republic. And we thank you from the bottom of our hearts. I mean, the moment that we saw there, it's, it's really politicians hitting pause on any political differences, isn't it? But the reality is, surrounding that moment, there, you know, th this, this wasn't really the case. Can you just tell us, you used to work for NATO as well, about the context of the transatlantic relations that we find ourselves celebrating D-Day today? Well, I would argue that NATO was born on D-Day. Yes. Certainly, the actual organisation, the treaty, didn't come into existence until 1949, five years later. But that day was the day when, for the first time, Americans, Canadians, Europeans came together under a unified command, under General Eisenhower, 
collectively, all working together in a great enterprise to defeat the greatest tyranny that the world so has the ever known of, before. So it was the birth of the alliance. And, and that there. was the principle, that right. multinational command, multinational burden sharing, which was replicated with General Eisenhower, who mm. was the first Allied Supreme Commander when NATO was created. So I think it's a powerful lesson of what makes for a successful enterprise. That's a, that's a lesson you're talking about. But, you know, Donald Trump being here in Europe, he, of course, he's under scrutiny. Every move he makes is, 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 is judged. Now, but judging from the way the U.S. government conducts itself, it's almost like it's my way or the highway. It seems to be the, the general tone. Do you think that um, the importance of multinational alliances is somewhat lost on the U.S. president? Well, it's certainly the, 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 the context right. of, of this, uh, this commemoration. I think it's fascinating to see that we uh, that the, the leaders commemorated something that, that was really the birthplace of this post-war uh, world order that is, seems to be crumbling now precisely because, uh, uh, partly because of the U.S. president's uh, behavior and, and world view. But I think it was also fascinating to listen to uh, Chancellor Merkel. She highlighted the reconciliation and unity that was also born uh, out of this out of this war um, and the defeat of, of, of Nazism and uh, I, I think that's that's something to carry on for the EU as well and I think unity is what it's going to define EU politics in the next year so do you think that if there were to be another well uh, I wouldn't say war but if, if there was a need to have a unity amongst the world uh, countries and leaders do you think it would happen the same way that it did before in terms of unity or is the world a little bit more fragmented this time around well, I fear it is. It's uh, more fragmented. Yes, and that, that people have sort of a bit forgotten uh, what, what, what we have gained mm -hmm. through that unity and that, that people take it for granted. But, but the peace, the cooperation, that uh, working together for a common goal is, is something that we have to work on every day. And, mm -hmm. and I think the European elections, at least, are, are pointing in the right direction, that, that people that support that multilateral order, that support European peace, that support European cooperation, have, have had a huge victory at the, at the ballot box uh, last weekend. Yeah, I mean, it, this is, um, it's such a somber um, commemoration, but at the same time, it is important that we discuss the, the context, you know, the rise of nationalism and the kind of rhetoric that we see, um, uh, see happening. So this remembrance in the attitudes, do you think that it's just paying lip service to the lessons that were really... Um, presented or learned uh, from that no, time? I, I no, don't th I don't think so, uh, because what D-Day is all about is what happens to 19-year-old kids and the price they have to pay with their lives when political leaders don't act like in the 1930s to deal with economic nationalism, beggar thy neighbour policies, isolationism, when they allow, at the time, the League of Nations, international organisations to uh, atrophy uh, and wars come back, the, the cost of human forgetfulness. What really struck me about those veterans was that many of them were in their 90s or nearly 100 uh, and they have had 75 yeah. years of extra life that the 19-year-old kids who died on D-Day, 10,000 of them, did not have. So, to Indeed. my mind, that sends a powerful signal uh, of the price that ordinary people but pay will... when politicians get it wrong. Uh, and uh, we could be in a similar situation today. You mentioned that mm -hmm. with nationalism and isolation. Because we hear, we hear this so, kind of so rhetoric let's already take, from let's, ta let's take some inspiration uh, from, the, from that lesson. OK, well, you know, one country remembers D-Day differently. I mean, there's several, several countries commemorating that today and Germany does not hold any official commemoration so let's get that for you from our correspondent uh, Jonah Kalgren who's joining us now uh, from Berlin um, Jonas, this is clearly something very sensitive in Germany so what does D-Day mean to Germans well, for a very long time, Germany and the Germans didn't really know how to deal with this day and the other days. The day when you mark the invasion of Berlin, uh, the day when you mar uh, mark the end of the war. But you, you have to remember, a lot of Germans died on D-Day. A lot of Germans died in the last phase of the war, as in the entire war. Cities were scarred. For example, here behind me, it doesn't look like much, but before the war, there were large buildings here. Large parts of Dresden were destroyed, and so on and so on. But at the same time, of course, there were the guilt and the shame, and that was really overwhelming. Now, in the 1980s, a German president gave a speech when he said, listen, we need to start thinking about these days as liberation days. These are the days when we were liberated from our own evil, from our own fascism. And that has really taken root, and that's how most Germans look at it now. We were the aggressors. We were brutal and we were liberated from this from ourselves and at the same time Europe was liberated from our evil 
Now, uh, Bild, the largest selling newspaper in Germany, ran an editorial today. And it ended quite powerfully, I think, because it also looked at the state of the world now. And it said, listen, we can laugh at the Brexit Brits and we can complain about the Trump Americans, but every single breath we take as liberated free Germans and Europeans, we owe to these countries to this day. And this is how many Germans look at this this day and other days like it. All right. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, your correspondent, Jonah Kalgren there. Of course, I'll go to you, Daniel, as a young German. Um, the, you know, we're talking about this collective guilt. And I was asking you before the show if this is definitely strongly felt. It's not just something you, you think about, you learn in school, but it's actually meaningful to young Germans. Yeah, I think so. Um, it, it is something that takes up a lot of space during our school, high school education. I'm not sure whether it's guilt. It's, it's more a responsibility that, mm -hmm. that, that we have for, for something that happened in the past. And, and our responsibility, my generation, is not to forget about that. That we, we haven't lived it. We, we haven't done anything, obviously, ourselves. But it is our task to, to not forget so what, what happened. So through that prism, how do, we, how do we analyze and look at the nationalist language and sometimes even fascist language that we see coming out of German, Germany and politicians in Germany? I, I think we, we have to see that that language of me before everybody else, the whole America first, Italy first, Germany first kind of rhetoric that is coming up in, in many countries around Europe, uh, that that ultimately leads into that conflict. It might be economic at first, uh, it might be a social conflict, but all these conflicts ultimately have, have that risk to leading into war and, and to uh, that alienation with mm. the other, where, where, where that is painted as something, yeah, ultimately as something inhumane and, mm. and, and that you don't have to respect and don't have to treat as a fellow human. And I think that, that's incredibly dangerous. And you be familiar with conflict, um, you know, look study of it. Um, how close are we now to that? Is that something that should be that we should worry about? And in what form? I'm not talking about the kind of wars that we had before, but in terms of fragmentation and conflict today, how bad is it? Well, first of all, NATO has held, uh, despite sometimes the tensions in the transatlantic relationship, and we still have thousands of American troops in Europe today, in Germany, in the Baltic states, in Poland, uh, to defend uh, uh, Europe, and no NATO country has been attacked with conventional forces. So the formula has worked for 70 years, and therefore I think the number one answer to your question is that we should keep it because it's a tried and tested procedure, and NATO has integrated several of the countries that, mm. of course, were formerly occupied by the Soviet Union after World War II. But, of course, we also have to be mindful of the fact uh, that there are new rising powers in the world, uh, of course, uh, uh, and also that because, in a way, NATO has been so successful at blocking conventional war, powers that want to challenge us use other means. Mm -hmm. You know, the cyber attacks, what's called hybrid warfare. So, no complacency. Uh, peace is always at the price of eternal vigilance. And I think D-Day, again, is also a reminder of that. And what's interesting is that the argument for, for the leaders who, who were trying to stop Brexit from happening is that, you know, Europe has had peace for so long and let's not break that, but then Brexit is still happening just in this context. Yes, It's yes. interesting that this is happening. Yes, and we've heard some of the uh, veterans uh, saying that they, they actually don't understand Brexit and it's a step in the wrong direction. Uh, but if I could just pick up on the responsibility, responsibility point that Daniel made, I think it's also important to note that in, in, in Europe, in the eastern part of Europe, where I come from, uh, because of the Soviet rule, because of communism, it was uh, basically this reconciliation process was stifled. Mm -hmm. And so this discussion on responsibility over what, the events of World War II right. has, uh, has not been yet finished, it's basically. Not, it's not as robust yeah. as it is, is yeah. in Germany. All right, we've all been mentioning uh, veterans, and that's uh, exactly where we're going now. Because let's uh, take a pause and take a listen to some of the D-Day veterans who today are reflecting on what they went through 75 years ago. I cast my mind back to that 75 years ago and uh, you know, I, I just can't believe what happened and that, that we're still here after all those years afterwards. There were 125,000 members of Bomber Command. There were 55,000 casualties. That's how dangerous it was. 
of things happening. Ships everywhere. Motorboats, big ones and little ones, landing craft. It was after I come off the beaches and got back to my own ship that the trouble started. On the boat, I got dead, and I got wounded, and I got life soldiers. And they're crying, Mama, Mama, Mama. And you know, everybody thinks you cry to God. When you're dying, you cry, Mama. As I went down, I looked aside and I could see my lieutenant, Lieutenant Fields. He's being hit by the same automatic fire. He's standing there and when it, it just taking all these hits. When the, when the machine gun stopped firing, he just hit the ground, he was gone. You can't imagine the feelings within people who took part from our angle, sailing into the unknown. And after what was it, was it worth it or what? I don't think, I don't think it was, because no one took no notice now. Uh, now, it's all forgotten, isn't it? It's all forgotten. I, I sacrificed my youth so the youth of the day can enjoy their youth in peace. We who remain remember those friends who shared a life. And when we're gone, that memory will die we become historical archives. Such uh, the powerful reflections there, and, and, and you were saying this earlier, what the gen last gentleman was saying, that after they're all gone, it will all be forgotten. Is that true? Uh, it will be true in the sense that we won't be able to have commemorations like this, which are on TV that we're talking about today, which resonate with millions of people. That makes it, I think, all the more important for historians and for politicians and so on to find ways through education and so on to make sure that a people... A conscious are still effort to not... Uh, 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 exactly. OK. All right. Well, we have a lot more coming up on the programme. A win for the centre-left in Denmark's elections, but did they borrow some ideas from the far right to get it? Plus, Theresa May's time as Conservative Party leader comes to an end. Who is next in line? That is coming up. Welcome back to World Politics. A political makeover appears to have paid off for Denmark's Social Democrats. The centre-left party is firmly back in power after sweeping up the largest share of votes in national elections. Now at the helm is Meta Fredriksen on track to become Denmark's youngest ever prime minister. Now her party beat that of the current leader Lars Løkke Rasmussen and crushed support for the far-right Danish People's Party in a campaign that saw the Social Democrats adopt anti-immigration policies and pledge to protect the welfare system system and fight climate change. Nu bliver opgaven efter at i danskere har talt at forsøge at danne en ny regering. Jeg føler mig overbevist om, at det kan lade sig gøre. For den tillid, I danskere i dag viser et nyt flertal, den må vi ikke smide på gulvet. Vi har muligheden for sammen at sætte en ny retning for Danmark. Our political editor Darren McCaffrey is in Denmark and has been following all of the latest for us from Copenhagen. Darren, so what's been the reaction to the results over there? Well, people have had their say, Tessa, but now it is up to the politicians to work out how they can form some type of stable uh, government here in Denmark. It may well last uh, for weeks, not least of all because, yes, the Social Democrats, as you pointed out, did do well last night. They topped the poll, but they didn't do that well. Uh, they did see a drop in support. In fact, they actually saw one of the worst uh, results in decades here in Denmark. And that is why many people say the possibility of a minority government is simply not going to wash, that they are going to have to form some type of coalition with other liberal centre or left-wing parties. Well, let's speak to one of the MPs who was elected last night. Congratulations to uh, Sophia Nielsen from the Social Liberal Party here in Denmark. You're one of the parties that's in negotiations with the Social Democrats. What will they have to do to get your support? 
Well, they will have to uh, get Denmark in a new direction, away from the simple politics that we've had for the last four years, where you count restrictions on foreigners or immigrants who've been here for decades, even born and raised here, uh, and instead count uh, reductions on uh, our uh, CO2 emissions. I mean, do something which actually solves real problems and not invent uh, others which divide uh, the population, but, uh, but make them come together and solve problems, give them hope, instead of uh, inciting them with fear. And do you think the Social Democrats have become an anti-immigrant party to a degree? Yes, they voted for most uh, of the laws that this government has uh, passed in the last four years. They've been very hard to uh, differentiate from each other and from the Danish People's Party, uh, whom uh, we are very much the opposite of. We want to solve real problems, climate change, invest in education, invest in our children, look to the future, uh, be an integrated part of the European Union. We used to have that together with the Social Democrats, but they've gone away from that for the last four years. Now we hope to turn them back on the right direction. We need to go forward. Many people say they haven't got a mandate last night. Um, are, are you going to go into coalition with them if they give you uh, those assurances on, on immigration and climate change? It's not uh, important who sits in government for us. Uh, the important part is the politics and policy. And there needs to be thing to happen on climate change, ambitious goals here, investments in education and our children, fewer poor children, uh, and l last but not least, more integration, not less. We practically have a, had a stop on integration uh, very late in this period, uh, and we need to get away from that. Okay, and how long do you think it's going to take to form a government? Oh, we've got all the time in the world. <laughs> uh, it's not uh, what uh, will take us back. We can form something which we can like, a government which we can actually like and which we agree with uh, in detail on the policy, uh, then it's okay if it takes time and it's probably going to take a while, yeah. Uh, Sophia Nelson, thank you very much indeed for joining us uh, there. Uh, recently elected last night. Now, it must be said that I've been talking to the people of Copenhagen uh, today. It is interesting that, yes, climate change was an issue, immigration was an issue, but so was welfare too, something that's not been much talked about. Let's have a look at what at the people of Denmark uh, told me what their thoughts were on this election result. Immigration and climate, my two, my two main uh, sub subjects. The big issue was that uh, this new party that came along, which is uh, critical against Muslims, uh, it was important for me that they, they didn't get in, that they didn't get enough vote to get in the parliament. The environment, first of all, but that's like a widespread in all of the the parties in Denmark, except a few. But um, and also the. Um, the immigrants and also welfare? The climate. Yes, yeah. climate. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, climate became uh, very fast uh, the, the, the big issue. Welfare. 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 Yes. Welfare. We are elderly people, so <laughs> <laughs> we, we need some welfare the rest of our life. Uh, so there you have it, Tessa. Welfare, immigration, definitely climate change. And I think to a degree, speaking to people, a sense that they got motivated to come out to keep the far right out of politics here in Denmark. It is something we've seen repeated elsewhere across Europe, most notably in Spain in recent months. And it should be said that there are now left, centre-left governments in power in Finland and in Sweden and now in Denmark in the last year. Maybe the rise of the right and the collapse of the centre has been maybe slightly overplayed. But from the Danish Parliament, back to the European Parliament, Tessa. All right, thanks for that, uh, Darren, there. And joining us here in the studio, back again today, is uh, Karin Axelsson from the Danish uh, Broadcasting Corporation. And also joining us, Brian McGuire, journalist and broadcaster from Your Active, and uh, still with us, Esther Zalan from the EU Observer. I I'd like to ask you, because it was really interesting what people were saying, you know, climate, um, mm. welfare, and what was, was interesting to them. And there was a, a Gallup poll in February that said that 57% um, of Danes think the government should prioritize climate change. And among the young people, it's 69%. Mm. But if you were a voter in Denmark, when you vote for the Social Democrats with an anti-immigration platform, are you consciously turning a blind eye to their anti-immigration policies, or is that also a vote for that kind of rhetoric? 
It depends. Uh, as we talked about yesterday, immigration has always been, uh, you know, the, the weak side of the Social Democratic Party. They have lost election after election on this topic. So she turned uh, to the right, and every time someone asked, uh, said something about, we want to strength, strengthen the politics, the Social Democrats and the other said, we want to do that too. We'll copy that. So they kind of, you know, turned this uh, weak side but away. But do people have to ignore that bit if they care no, about climate and welfare and then yes, I just have to vote for social democrats? It, it, certainly people, they want tight immigration okay. rules. But uh, this signal is also very clear that they say, OK, we've had it. Uh, now we had to tough rules. We had uh, fewer migrants coming to Denmark, fewer mm -hmm. refugees coming to Denmark in the last couple of years than for uh, many years. Mm -hmm. Let's move to other topics that are more uh, important for us, like welfare. Mm -hmm. we had a lot of cuts after the financial crisis. So pension and retirement has been a big subject uh, during these uh, election debates. And also the climate change. Right. So we had the social democratic leader being confronted by the young activists saying, okay, are you aware that the roses that you hand out to people, they mm -hmm. have a, a CO2 footprint? So uh, just to, 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 to tell you that, that that's been a big subject also for, for the social democrats. So it's right. not turning it's the blind eye. It's just right. that you know that you get the same uh, also, immigration policy with her and, and also with the, the others. The tough immigration policy in Denmark has has existed for a few years, so we can say that maybe the shift to the right in general has happened a while back uh, already. What is your reading about what's happening um, in Denmark here? What really matters? I think to what, what Diane said is the the rise of the right seems to be have been exaggerated. We could right. also put another way, or it might have backfired on them and benefited mm. other parties. Or that could. we see that Europe is rebalancing. That right. uh, the migration caps, the people are not content with the change that have been made and now they're prepared to look uh, at other issues as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, we, we saw in, the, in that clip that climate is, is clearly a, a super important topic, but welfare as well. And if mm -hmm. people are feeling that the economy is not doing so well, they're going to look back uh, to how they're going to be protected. Right. And this could be an indication of, of, of uh, other underlying factors which maybe weren't discussed so prominently during, during the campaign. It's interesting when you say rebalancing, because one, one of the comments there was that he voted to prevent the far right, the yes. hard line uh, far right from winning. And I've seen that uh, reflected in different... Um, interviews where one a man, Danish Muslim, said that, in fact, the far right had done what not men, not Muslim leaders have not been able to do. It's unite everybody <laughs> to, and to go out and vote and vote yeah. against a party. Yes, I mean, I think we've seen it with the European elections there as well, that there is a, some sort of a backlash, like, that, OK, immigration is important and let's talk about immigration, but maybe let's not have the hate rhetoric and, and, the, and the divisive politics of the far right. So there is some, some sort of a backlash. And in a European context, I think what's also interesting interesting is that the welfare and social issues were so important because this will be something uh, to consider for, for the coalition that's forming here in the European Parliament as well. Because mm. I think people, voters have shown also in the European elections that climate, social justice after years of austerity and, and the euro crisis is back on the, on so the agenda. I think it's, just one point to make. Mm. It's important to look at why people are not buying fear anymore. Uh, why did Obama come into power? Because people wanted hope. They wanted to change the narrative. People psychologically but get... But the Social Democrats stole far-right ideas in terms of... Stole, well, took some ideas from the far-right in terms of anti-immigration rhetoric. That is still Yes, but like fear. you said, this was, these were decisions that were made some time ago. Those, okay. those positions were established. We didn't see this, this fearful uh, exasperation that people felt about the migration crisis. This, mm -hmm. this is something that seems to have been settled to, the, to a reasonable degree, and now people want something more optimistic. We heard uh, the social liberal uh, MP talking about this as well. We want to speak about mm. the future. She's not just saying that. She knows that's what resonates yeah. with the voters. Now we need to change And it's that interesting though. what signal this is sending to the rest of Europe yeah. as well. I think it's a different trend. We see trend, it with Sanchez as, as well yeah. in Spain. He, he was uh, talking about the same kind of right. narrative. But now I want to talk about Vestaya. Um, <laughs> what does this mean for her? So Margrethe Vestaya, one mm. of the f leading, let's say, uh, candidates' names to become commission president. Mm. What does this mean for her in terms of support from the future government that's going to be... Well, you could see that it's actually her party that is they one of the big with, yeah. winners in this election. And, and what we saw her party colleague just saying, that they are used to this role of kingmakers. Margrethe Vestia herself was the kingmaker of the last uh, time the Social Democrat, uh, Democratic Party was forming a government. Mm. So... Uh, they are used to this role, and of course, they're bringing this into the table that, as part of these long negotiations, that of course you should work for her candidacy. Mm -hmm. uh, and just a short remark for what you said. And another interesting perspective in a European perspective mm -hmm. is that uh, this was actually a win of the old parties, the traditional parties in Denmark, right. contrary to a lot of uh, other countries. You mm -hmm. see that last time we had a protest elections, the uh, national right parties or far right parties, they yep. got their chance, and this time they 
totally it was a bloodshed. It was bloodshed. Bloodshed. Yeah. Mm. People, the voters, the, the went back to the, the old parties. Yeah. And one of the old parties is the radical uh, left. It's called like right. the liberal social liberal party. Yeah. And uh, of course, this is going to be a demand for them at the table that you it's should. Very, work for really, very chances. interesting. I want a quick word from both of you before we go on Vestaya. Just a let the prediction. <laughs> Ooh, difficult, but it's it's interesting that there will be one more person at the table uh, at the European Council among leaders who will right. be pushing for her, and uh, Maybe. obviously. Maybe. Well, so what's your take, Brian, before we go? Well, I spoke to some others around Parliament today, and they say, yeah, this maybe helps her, but not very much. Right. And okay. probably, uh, we talked about this earlier, is that uh, it'd be hard for the Social Democrats to say mm. they're not supporting Vestager sure. on this. But on, uh, on paper, this is an extra socialist vote, which would normally go to Timmermans. Um, so but let's, probably see. The best let's see how the scoreboard is uh, in a few days. All right, coming up on Raw Politics, our female dress code sexist. Well, the Japanese health minister is under fire for saying that high heels are necessary for the workplace. Hmm. That's coming up. Welcome back to Raw Politics. Well, the race to replace Theresa May is heating up in the UK. That's because today is her last day as leader of the Conservative Party. Well, that story and much more in today's Brexit Brief. It's all quiet in Downing Street today. The cat and mouse game of Brexit has moved for the day to the eastern English city of Peterborough. A by-election is taking place here and, surprise, surprise, Brexit looks set to be the defining issue. With Nigel Farage's Brexit party hoping to pick up its first seat in Parliament. I don't know exactly what your family is, but stick around, let's do this deal. <laughs> Well, Donald Trump might want her to stay on, but Theresa May is firmly sticking to her departure timetable. Tomorrow, she will officially step down as Conservative leader, kick-starting the race to find her successor. For those hoping to fill Theresa May's shoes, it's all about the Brexit policy. Environment Secretary Michael Gove has criticized Boris Johnson for talking up a no-deal Brexit in October. Mr Gove raised the possibility of a further Brexit extension to get a better deal from Brussels. Meanwhile, the hardliner and former Brexit Secretary Dominic Raab has refused to rule out closing down Parliament in order to stop MPs blocking a no-deal Brexit. With the new Prime Minister expected to take up residence here in mid-July, there's no sign of this debate coming to an end anytime soon. And joining us to discuss this is John Proctor, British MEP with the European and Conservatives and Reformist Group, and Jude Curtin-Darling, a British MEP with the Socialists and Democrats, and still with us, Brian McGuire from Euractive. OK, I'm really curious, because Donald Trump was just there, he commented on Brexit, and then now you've got this race to who is going to replace the Conservative Party. What is the mood like in London right now? Is it... Uh... A big mess or uh, nervous mm, nerves or a mess? Really? <laughs> no, of course not. No, no, no. Um, look, look, it's been very difficult for our, our party over uh, over the last month, uh, over the last year. Um, we need to get over this. We need a new leader. We need to coalesce around that uh, new uh, new leader, and we need to move forward. We need to deliver Brexit for uh, the people in in Britain, and we need to make sure that. Uh, uh, Jeremy Corbyn doesn't get into Downing Street. Can you give us a sense of where the party's leaning? Oh, uh, it, it, it's far too early to say. Okay. Um, it's up to the members of Parliament to narrow down to, uh, to two and then it'll go to the membership and we'll see where it goes from there. OK. And uh, reaction from, <laughs> from Jude on what's well, going on the, over there? The Tory psychodrama continues <laughs> and it pulls us closer to the edge of the cliff again. Um, we know Do you have a that preference? Do you have a preference? A preference who, in terms of Tory, who would be the yeah. Tory leader? Um, no, I think it's a pretty uh, <laughs> grim field, if I'm honest. If you're in a situation where you think that Michael Gove is talking reason, then you know <laughs> that the whole of the candidate field must be really poor. Um, I've been quite impressed by how Rory Stewart has campaigned, mm -hmm. uh, but clearly he doesn't stand a chance inside the party. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I'm, I'm really hoping that um, some of the candidates, people like Esther McVeigh and others, 
um, really have a difficult time. Okay, so let's, time. let's bring in those names, because there are a, lot, a few names mm -hmm. that we're talking about. So let's take a look at who could be uh, walking into number 10 in a few weeks. So there's the high-profile Brexiteer and former Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson, of course, along with his former running mate Michael Gove. Uh, Foreign Secretary Jeremy Hunt has said that he wants a job as well. And so has the Brexiteer uh, Andrea Leadsom and a former Brexit Secretary Dominic Raab. Cabinet newcomer Rory Stewart, uh, Home Secretary Sajid Javid and Health Secretary Matt Hancock. So there's, these are some of the names floating around. And um, I was asking you, Brian, earlier about the fact that um, each of them have different ideas of, of the Brexit extension. Is it a hard deadline? Is it not a hard deadline? Does that matter? No, Will that make a difference? Europe is, it doesn't really, Theresa can make it stay for another two years and it'll still be exactly the same <laughs> situation. It doesn't matter who the leader of the Conservative Party is going to be in terms of Brexit negotiations. Europe is absolutely clear what's going to happen. Ireland is resolute about the backstop. That's not going to change. You can talk about withdrawal agreement afterwards, things like this. This is this is just simply, uh, a, a, like Jude says, a psychodrama. And the question is whether we have a general election first and then a referendum, or a referendum, then a general election, because nothing else is going to yeah, change. Because each of them are now presenting their version of Brexit and what to do, I mean, in, in, your, in the Tory party. So now that we've shown the faces and the names, you know, can you tell us who is actually doing quite well? I know it's too early, but give us a, a, little, a little hint on well, who's I, kind I, of I, ahead. I, I think your, your piece there showed the leading lights, uh, those, uh, those who are there. And as, uh, as we, we all know, it's up for Are you happy with the MPs. choices? Do you think I, Conservative I, I, parties... I don't want any more choice, right. that's for sure. There's, <laughs> uh, there's almost too much choice uh, mm -hmm. as, it, uh, as it is. But there's a lot of talent there. Is uh, there? A lot, a lot of, <laughs> but there is uh, talent. Talent for what? Talent for chaos? There's, there's, can there's, anyone a of, deliver... there's a lot of... There's a lot of talent there, there's a lot of experience, and there are people who I believe there who will deliver Brexit. And at the, at the end of the day, whether, whether, whether I like it, or do you like, or anybody likes or doesn't like uh, the idea of Brexit, the fact of the matter is, is the British people voted to leave yeah, the European genuinely. Union. And also, the thing that came through time and time again, leavers and remainers ended up voting for the but Brexit party. But that's what party. Theresa May has said is she's been trying to do, so genuinely, who among those... Many remainers for the Brexit party. But who, who among uh, those you, have you, delivered you, you would, you would be astonished. Deliver, but... You'd be astonished. Our, I would be astonished. Our, 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 seriously, our telephone canvassing uh, that I was doing day in, day out, that's what... Uh, there was huge numbers of people who were telling us I that's exactly what we were going to do. Really? No, 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 seriously, seriously. So in terms of negotiating a, a Brexit, uh, you, you know, who among those do you think would be able to do a better job than Theresa May? Well, honestly, in, in all honesty, I think it's very unlikely that we will be able to get a better deal um, than the one we have today as an EU member. And the deal that Theresa May negotiated, which wasn't a good deal, I don't think, for, for Britain for a whole host of reasons, the backstop not being the main one, but that's the key one for many um, Conservatives. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see how any of those people are putting forward ideas which would uh, gain any resident resonance in the EU side of the table. And we can talk as much as we want um, amongst ourselves as Brits, but ultimately our negotiating partner is here in Brussels, the mm -hmm. EU 27, and it's clear, as you said, that there's no movement there's um, from the mm -hmm. rest of Europe. So this is all a very academic exercise, right. which is wasting time as we head towards that October um, deadline. Um, um, so and is it an extension or what? What is this? And the an reality, extension? The, I yeah. think we, we have to assume there'll be another extension. But it may be conditional at this point. Yes, I mean, why it will would be you give, why would you give another extension without any kind of conditions? Mm -hmm. So they, they've got to work out whether it's going to be election or so referendum. election or referendum. Uh, neither. Um, <laughs> no, no, neither. There, there's no need for, for either. We, we've had a referendum. The British people expressed their, their view. We had an ele election in 2017. The mm. British people expressed their view. It wasn't what I wanted or what Theresa May wanted, but that was the, uh, the view of the British people. But we are at an absolute deadlock. Coming up? at the moment. So the only way out of the situation that we're in is either that the referendum or a general election. The only way they get to wash their hands of this is to have another referendum. OK, all right. Well, we do uh, want to hear uh, your views on, on a lot of the issues that we're talking about. But first, uh, let's uh, go to uh, Japan, because there is a backlash today. The government has reacted uh, to calls uh, from women to not make high heels mandatory. Uh, let's take a look at this. High heels, uncomfortable, outdated, and unnecessary. That's how thousands of women in Japan see this icon of female fashion footwear. A power symbol for some, but for actor and writer Yumi Ishikawa, they're just another example of the deep-rooted misogyny in her country. 
and why she's spearheading a campaign to scrap the stiletto. Armed with a petition and the hashtag coup too, she's taken her case all the way to the Labour Ministry, seeking government protection from tyrannical dress codes. But the welcome wasn't a warm one. Despite a mountain of signatures, one minister hit back, saying heels at work were, quote, occupationally necessary and appropriate. Nevertheless, she's not alone in her quest for change. For years, women across the world have taken a stand against what they say is everyday sexism, hoping the old-fashioned practice will eventually fall flat. Jude, who isn't in high heels today. That's right. <laughs> what is, uh, how do you... I mean, this is com a different culture, different part of the world. Um, your reaction to this? Well, ultimately, women should be able to wear what they want to. Um, in the workplace and outside the workplace in life. And if people want to wear high heels, that's absolutely fine. If they don't want to wear high heels, like I am not wearing high heels, um, that should heels. also <laughs> be that should also be absolutely so fine. Beyond... There are no diktats in the same way towards men. So until the day, the world, well, until the day that all men are obliged to wear three-piece tweed suits with a tie in all temperatures, <laughs> I think that men should stop talking so, about beyond, what women wear. Beyond just high heels, or what about dress codes where it's appropriate in workplaces? I mean, you can talk about skirts, you can talk about everything else. It's not just heels. What about the, you know, dressing appropriately, as some uh, would say? Well, what's appropriately? Uh, look, 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 I agree with you. Uh, uh, women should be able to wear what they want. Men should be able to wear uh, what, what they want. What no I, more suits what and ties I, in Parliament. What I, what I, what I don't want is, is for, for men uh, to be forced to wear high heels because I would find it <laughs> impossible. You should probably try. <laughs> men should probably try and then maybe they'll change their minds. Okay, coming up, uh, we want to hear from you on this. Are female dress codes sexist? And what about mandatory high heels? What do you think? So your call is coming up 7 p.m. at Brussels time. Uh, that's 6 p.m. if you're in the UK or Ireland. Contact information is on your screen. 00 800 You can join the debate uh, online on social media. Use the hashtag RawPolitics. Our lives are opening after the break. In my opinion, definitely not. Why not? I think he's a fascist dictator. I think it's fair to say you're not a fan. <laughs> That's an understatement. Okay. He's very able to turn lies into truth. He is the president of the United States, though. He is the most powerful person on the planet. No, Europe does not need more Trump. He's a liar. He's a racist. If we looked at Europe, we already have our own Trumps. Look at Salvini as well. Well, I think he's had a very successful uh, visit here to, to England. So those were some of the highlights from last night's Your Call, and we're doing it again tonight, and here is what is coming up. World leaders and hundreds of veterans gathered in Normandy to commemorate the 75th anniversary of D-Day. Over 150,000 Allied troops stormed German-occupied beaches, marking the beginning of the end of the Nazi regime and solidifying a transatlantic bond that has spanned decades. If one day can be said to have determined the fate of generations to come, in France, in Britain, in Europe and the world, that day was the 6th of June, 1944. We want to know, what does D-Day mean to you? Stepping down, tomorrow is set to be British Prime Minister Theresa May's last official day as Conservative leader. With 11 contenders waiting in the wings, making noise, one of them is Environment Secretary Michael Gove, saying yesterday that the 31st October Brexit deadline is arbitrary, while others, such as Boris Johnson and former Brexit Secretary Dominic Raab, say the date is set in stone, with or without a deal. With the future of Brexit still in question, who should replace Theresa May? In Japan, many companies require women to wear high heels at work, but now some are saying enough is enough. Nearly 20,000 women signed a petition to the government to get rid of a practice that they call discriminatory and outdated. But the health minister, a man, wasn't having it, saying high heels are, quote, occupationally necessary and appropriate. 
In Europe, Canada and the U.S., women have had success protesting dress, hair and makeup requirements. But what do you think? Are female dress codes sexist? Come on Europe, have your say. What does D-Day mean to you? Who should replace Theresa May? And are female dress codes sexist? So you know what to do. You can get in touch. You can call us for free at 0800-3337-002. Send an email to rawpaul at euronews.com. And on social media, use the hashtag rawpolitics. And you can also look for us on Skype. All right. Uh, hosting with me tonight is our Brussels correspondent, Jack Parrick. He's right here. And we will be joined by Brian McGuire from Reactive. And still with us now is Esther Zalan from the EU Observer. And this, I mean, today being an important uh, uh, commemoration day, let's talk about what D-Day means to you. I think it means something different from Europeans from different parts of the world. I mean, what does D-Day mean? It's such an interesting uh, point of history. It's such a focal point, especially as a Brit. It's a massive part of our sort of historical upbringing, a real, you know, TV shows representing it all the time. I actually went to Omaha Beach and Utah Beach once myself, and it's such a powerful is a, place. Is it personal? Is it very personal for a lot of Brits? As well? for, me, for me, yeah, with my, I have family connections to D-Day personally, mm -hmm. and, and I think a lot, of, a lot of British and American people do, definitely. And what about... Um... Hungary. Yeah, well, um, or maybe in Europe in general. Yeah, D Day. It's a bit, it's a bit different for 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 me coming from Hungary. Uh, we obviously study about it, but uh, and, and know about it, but it's not that personal. I mean, the, Hungary was on the Eastern Front. We had the different battles, different conflicts. Uh, the Russian army liberation be soon became occupation. So it's a, a, a bit more complicated, but definitely mm -hmm. as the start of the end, beginning of the end. It's the, the English Channel, you know, is such an important yeah. body of water between Europe and the UK. And there's, as a Brit, there's such an idea of what that means. And crossing it in the war is, is so significant, I think. Right. I mean, maybe we romanticise as well in this journey. Perhaps, Perhaps as well, yeah. yeah. And what about uh, where you're from, I, Brian, as Ireland? In Ireland, I come from Belfast. Belfast, Belfast was mm. almost obliterated by German bombers. And uh, my grandma used to tell me about how they would go to the mountains and, and hide in the ditches while, while the city burned. And uh, I remember one neighbour talking about taking the burnt bodies out of the houses after the, the bombings as well. Um, but I think D-Day resonates because it has a universal theme of good against evil. It's that clear. This was a, a, a fascist mm -hmm. Nazi regime which did so much uh, damage and uh, many nations united to destroy that. Crossing oceans, I mean, that's yeah, pretty impressive, is, the kind of and, collaboration that the and world And it has to be remembered did. because we can easily go back to that again. We're here mm -hmm. in the European Parliament. This is a construct of the peace process that mm -hmm. came out of the Second World War. Without Keyboard there, you said easily go back. Easily. I mean, that's, yeah. um, that's a bit... Very fragile uh, constructions. Never believed that the say. institutions will be there forever. Yeah. Well, there you go. Okay, join in this debate um, and this conversation and let us know what you think on the questions that we asked you. You know how to get in touch. You can call us. Uh, we're waiting for your call. It's 0800 333 uh, Send an email to rawpaul at euronews.com. And on social media, the hashtag is rawpolitics. And again, we are also on Skype. OK, tonight's raw moment. Uh, let's go to Ireland, because uh, President Trump, he has some wise words for Leo Varadkar. So it's an honor to be here. We'll be discussing various things. Probably you'll ask me about Brexit because I, I just left uh, some very good people that are very much involved with Brexit, as you know. And I think that'll all work out. It'll all work out very well. And also for you, with your wall, your border. Uh, I mean, we have a border situation in the United States, and you have one over here. But I hear it's going to work out very well. I think it's both going to work out well. It's going to work out very well here. seen that wall. Have uh, you seen that I wall? I seen that wall. <laughs> it would be, I think the only wall that most Irish people would probably be interested in is one to keep all around Ireland to keep the Brexiteers out. It's yeah. an incredible <laughs> moment. What Liam Varadkar must he have... Was <laughs> he was, he, he was <laughs> keeping it. Yeah, so he was brilliant, very dignified. Brilliant as he pointed out, it's the other way around, actually. That's not what we want. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Really impressive there from Varadkar. OK, OK, we would love to hear what you think on everything that we talked about on this programme. And don't forget, your call is right after this show. I'm easy to get in touch. Use the hashtag rawpolitics. And we're waiting for your call. 0800 Thanks for watching, and we're waiting for you. Thank you.